Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Project Ambrosia, the devlog. And I wanted to just go over my latest progress. So uh, since my last recording, I did a little bit of rearrangement. I figured that just stuffing everything into this third person uh, blueprint wasn't exactly the best way to do things as uh, this project is growing and uh, I'd like to organize things a bit better now. So that's one thing that's nice to be able to do, just to kind of hop into the editor where I need to look at things and not be confused where to look, right? Um, since then, I've been trying to solve the problem of how do I manage my maps? Um, for instance, I know that I can place a cell in the scene I know that I can rely on my pawn to just know that this is the cell I'm on and this is the cell I can go to because it does these raycasts to make sure that there's a cell there before moving, right? Well, I did a little research and with a little bit of uh, guidance from a tutor of mine, shout out to Matt, uh, I found that you could do something like what I want with level streaming. So the way it works is every time you open a level, there's always a persistent level available. And in that persistent level is objects that will always be uh, persistent, <laughs> in other words. And as you go through and add sub-levels by going levels and uh, create new, these levels can be streamed into the persistent level context um, whenever you approach or reach a level streaming volume. So as you can see here, I have this level streaming volume that encapsulates the entirety of the, what I'm calling the Genesis map. So here I have four cells. So at the very beginning, we have our player pawn and the cell that he resides on by default, because there needs to be something there before you uh, can move to anything else, right? So then on your first motion to go to the next cell, you collide with this level streaming uh, volume, and then it loads any cells that are determined to be within that. So this is considered a persistent level item, and so is this. So you'll see these two cells at first, and once you reach this cell, since you're inside the volume, these three Genesis cells are loaded in automatically. And I'll show you an example of that in a sec. Um, but that's really cool because now I can fully manage what gets loaded and unloaded throughout uh, the gameplay experience. So the next thing I did, oh, and this is where you actually configure where what level streaming volume affects what level. So the next thing I did is like, I was thinking about what this first map would be and that's why I settled on a Genesis naming convention. I thought like maybe this is like where the world starts for the player, right? What I also wanted to do is that every time you go into a cell, I'd like a nice little bit of context for where you are to nice and elegantly display on a text box to the, to the right of the player. And so I went ahead and hopped into the player pawn and I added a, uh, no, actually I hopped into the cell itself. So let me go back to my actors and hit up my map cell. Here, you can see I added an array of texts to serve as my description for any given cell. And I should note that I didn't know that you could put an instance of a cell and then just kind of hide what you need to. And it won't affect all the other cells at an instance level, which is great. Perfect for setting up the maps I'm trying to set up. And then after I set up the description and made it, you know, editable, I went through and added descriptions to each cell in line format because I'd like it to show one line at a time 
um, one after the other. And the reason for that is because I find it to be much more consumable when something is kind of just giving you little chunks at a time to read. I hate seeing a big chunk of text up front and makes me want to roll my eyes and go on. <laughs> so I figured this would be a much better experience. So after that, what I did was I started to use a new system that I uh, purchased called the event system on the out of the box by the out of the box publisher on the uh, UE marketplace. It's a pretty great system. It allows you to use an observer model instead of having to have references to other um, scene items for your uh, functionality to transfer between components. And here you see I have a cell payload and an on cell enter event. This is literally just, you just set it up as like a channel to um, call and receive events on. The payload is a class that you set up that describes what kind of data you want to pass through. So in this case, I want to set up this payload to send over the uh, array of text values. So with that set up, I can move on and say, okay, so on every cell, what do I want to happen? So it's actually on the player pawn. So every time we hit the interact button, we choose the next cell. We move to that next cell and we invoke the event system event with a cell payload. And that's just available to all components. You pass in the event blueprint you want to invoke. And then the payload is available here. You can also do it without payload. But then what happens here is this pops up because it's a editable instance. And then I grab the chosen cell the description that is associated with it, which is assigned in the scene editor, pass it in. I let the transition occur to move the player to the next pawn. And this handles that interaction at that point. Now, at this point, this event gets fired and then the animation plays. So what happens when this gets fired? Well, anything that is listening to this event will actually trigger whatever it wants to do. And what's listening to this event right now is the UI. So I set up this cell narrative UI and I put it in the right side of the screen. I gave it a variable reference. And then right here, you can add special events uh, listeners. So I don't know where it's categorized but I found it by going just on saying ES. So yeah, user created. This blueprint widget allows you to tell this component that it's listening to an event. And you can tell it over here what event it's listening to. Then in the graph, as you can see, there's a little bit of messiness, but you can use this on cell enter listener and hit one of these events. I went with the payload one, I hit the plus sign there, and that produced this for me. And it produced a payload generic object reference. So just to make sure that I knew when on cell enter was being fired, and then I made sure that we have a description line index. And then just to skip ahead, what you do is you cast to the payload that you want to be using. And what that does is it allows you to grab the description in this context. Now, this is a little bit weird because I wanted to use a for each loop, but it just did not allow for an animation to play and then move on to the next, and then animation to play and move on to the next. So I have this description line index for managing the loop. So every time this is fired, we clear the children from the net narrative scroll box. We check to see if we're on a valid index, which of course on the first run it will be valid. And then we grab the current line out of that description based on that line index or uh, index. 
So if it is valid, we move through the animation frames. If it's not, likely we're outside the bounds and we need to reset to zero and just stop. So as you can see here, I create a narrative line widget, very similar to how I did in, with the mock combat text uh, earlier videos. Then I add a child to the scroll box. I set the text on that return value there when I create a widget. I make sure we scroll to the end and then we play the animation that is on the target fade in, the target, which is the, uh, the narrative line. And like the other mock combat text, I have a narrative widget here. And it's just called narrative line. And then what I've done is I've defaulted it to display none in web speak, but it's also opacity zero. And then when I hit play on this fade in animation, it just fades in. Simple as that. I did a little adjustment to the, the slate style uh, text row definition. Uh, I made the text a little bit smaller for the default styles and then everything else is uh, pretty much the same. I had, that didn't change that much there. So with that said, now what it's gonna do is when it hits a cell, the actor for the map pawn, player pawn, is going to grab the description information from that cell and then invoke a event of on cell enter, passing that information to the payload and allowing the UI to update with a one after the other animation of each line of text using rich text. And that's it. So to see the result, as you can see, we started off, we have nice descriptive lines of what's going on. When I activate the window, let's say I wanna go north. And as you can see here, my thought is the first player experience would be to describe what classes that they could possibly choose from. in a way that is uh, hopefully some level to some level immersive with this world. And as you can see, as I quickly switch, since it clears out every single time, the children don't, you know, lag behind, they just get removed. And that's that. So, my future plans are to make it to where the cells might actually have some color and maybe some post-process volumes allow them to have some really neat effects to make the world, the, the overall UI look like you're in that cell um, from a context perspective. Like if you're in a desert, maybe there's some haze shader effects going on. Maybe there's some wind sound effects if it's windy. Um, a lot more to come. So. I'm having a lot of fun still, and uh, hope to see you next time. Ciao.